Welcome to the Clinical Education Initiative podcast, Conversations with CEI, where we feature conversations with clinical experts, their experience and insights on current health issues in the areas of HIV, primary care and prevention, sexual health, hepatitis C, and drug user health. So hi, Steve. Hi, Duran. Nice to see you again, even if it's only on Zoom. <laughs> well, thanks. It's good to see you too. So how are you doing today? Yeah, well, to be honest, I am feeling a little bit tired. I've noticed that a lot of healthcare workers seem to be more fatigued than usual these days. We have undergone a lot of changes in healthcare surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. It's starting to get to a lot of us, I think, not only affecting the care of the COVID patients, but it's really affecting the care of all of our patients especially those like I treat with other chronic diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C. I imagine that it is. And how do you think the care of hepatitis C patients has been impacted by COVID-19? Well, for one thing, the, the testing for hepatitis C has gone way down over the last couple of years. Patients just simply aren't coming in for the routine care that they used to pre-pandemic. And a lot of times that's when they're being tested. And when they are coming in, they're often having sort of more acute problems. Uh, so the hepatitis C testing either gets overlooked or postponed till the next time. So it's really been a problem. Wow, that's really interesting. So what about all of the hepatitis C testing sites, walk-in clinics, health fairs, and other places that people were getting tested? Well, Jaron, a lot of them have closed down uh, during the pandemic. So a lot of people being newly diagnosed the people that are being newly diagnosed with hepatitis C uh, really has decreased. They just don't have access to those testing sites. Wow, that sounds like a big problem. What's being done about it? One thing that we're constantly trying to do is keep the messaging going, even though the, some of the clinics are not <laughs> running as they used to. We're trying to keep the messaging alive so that despite there are more urgent medical issues in the COVID-19 era and in general, we're trying to get the message out there that chronic diseases like hepatitis C uh, really can't be ignored anymore. And these need to be integrated into routine medical care better than they already are. And I think it's worth pointing out, New York State is about to launch a really exciting campaign for ending the hepatitis C epidemic. So keep your eyes out for that. Wow, wow that sounds really interesting. I'll keep an eye out. So have there been any positive changes in practices brought about by COVID? Yeah, well, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there have been a number of really exciting changes in clinical practice. Some of these were sort of getting started before the COVID pandemic, but they're really getting much more popular and more mainstream once COVID really hit. When COVID came, it really impacted patients getting to their appointments. So I think the most obvious positive change has been, well, some people would say it's positive, but the most obvious change is the rise of video and um, telehealth. Uh, we now have a lot of platforms we can use like Zoom and Doximity and many others that have allowed us to reach out to patients who were previously unable to make it to their appointments. So I know from my own practice, if a patient can't get in or doesn't show up, uh, rather than just simply reschedule, I now reach out and say, hey, would you like to do this by Zoom or Doximity? You know, in a way, there's a lot of things that are lost during the telehealth appointment, like the good eye contact and, of course, the physical exam. But these are sort of made up for by convenience to the patient, their ability to schedule appointments on days that they're working. They can also do appointments where it's convenient for them and private rather than having to come into an office for each visit. In addition, COVID pandemic has caused us to really try to streamline some of the things we do and focus on things that are more crucial rather than maybe necessarily covering all of the possibilities in one visit like we used to do. One really great example of this is what we're going to talk about in today's podcast, which is the simplified treatment for hepatitis C. And this is being recommended on the IAS uh, USA and IDSA treatment guidelines, the AASLD and IDSA website, and they have put out treatment guidelines that pretty much anybody can follow for hepatitis C that can be found on the website hcvguidelines.org. 
Treatment for hepatitis C used to be quite complicated. And from what I've seen, we most often refer those patients to gastroenterology offices or clinics once their hepatitis C antibody test comes back positive. Yeah, you're right, John. I've been treating patients with hepatitis C since the early days. We had to use a three times a week injectable interferon along with ribavirin and literally hold the patient's hand through a year or more of treatment with pretty severe side effects. Many of these patients, I remember, felt like they had the flu the entire time they were on treatment, which could last a year to even a year and a half. Then we progressed to the direct acting antiretrovirals and the treatment response rates really went up tremendously. We were able to cut down on the treatment time, virtually eliminate the side effects for many patients. But, you know, we still had to do quite a lot of testing before treatment. Medications were very expensive. It was difficult to obtain insurance coverage. And I think because of all those things, we really still referred patients to GI or some dedicated hepatitis C clinics most of the time. And in fact, we ran one of these hepatitis C clinics and received referrals from all over the city because clinicians felt they were too busy to properly care for the hepatitis C patient. They didn't really know what to do because they sort of had it in their mind that treatment is pretty complicated. So why not keep doing that now? Refer patients with hepatitis C to GI clinics for treatment, that is. Well, for one thing we learned, and we knew all along, really, that referring patients for treatment isn't really always the best strategy because a lot of patients never showed up. They had difficulty making it to their initial appointment, so they never got evaluated. And then once they did see GI or the specialty hepatitis C clinic, they had difficulty making it back to their follow-up appointments. A lot of the GI clinics weren't really equipped to reach out to those patients. They may not have been as used to caring for patients with multiple barriers for accessing care. And with the COVID pandemic, a lot of those practices got really far behind in their routine care, uh, like cancer screenings and colonoscopies. So they weren't able to prioritize the hepatitis C treatment. Also, keep in mind that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has now lowered the recommended age for colonoscopy from 50 to 45. So a lot of these GI clinics are dealing with a five-year backlog of patients trying to get colonoscopies. Well, well, interesting. So what's in these new simplified treatment guidelines that might help? The new simplified treatment guideline that's outlined by the IDSA and ASLD on the webpage hcvguidelines.org basically show now show a streamlined process that could be done by virtually any practitioner right in their office in order to treat the majority of the hepatitis C patients they see without really doing any referral and really without changing their current clinical practice very much at all. The response rate to these treatments is over 98%. The safety is incredible. And now, finally, many of the insurance coverage issues have been addressed. So there really isn't very much that should stop any clinician from treating hepatitis C. Well, that sounds really interesting. Can you run through it? Yeah, sure. That's what the purpose of this podcast is, after all. And that's what our listeners are here for. What are we waiting for, Steve? So without waiting any more time, first up, um, I'm going to go to the uh, hcvguidelines.org website. And I urge everybody to do that um, because once you're on there, you'll see a lot of interesting information about testing, evaluating, monitoring, and eventually treating for hepatitis C. And if you have time, it's a learning experience. But here we'll cut right to the chase. If you've gotten this far, presumably you've already tested a patient found out they have positive hepatitis C antibodies. Next thing you want to do is run a hepatitis C PCR viral load, otherwise known as HCV PCR viral load. Make sure that the patient hasn't spontaneously seroconverted to hepatitis C PCR negative because those patients wouldn't need treatment. It's been estimated that up to about 15% patients who contract hepatitis C will spontaneously seroconvert to the HCV PCR negative over the first year of infection. So once you've got that out of the way, you've confirmed that the patient has hepatitis C DNA. The next step is to determine the genotype. For a lot of us, we're lucky enough that our labs automatically determine the genotype if the hepatitis C PCR DNA is positive. But for those of you not lucky enough, you have to order the hepatitis C genotype. And the good news is 
the hepatitis C streamlined approach that we're going to go over in this podcast, uh, the treatment is the same no matter what the genotype. So now that you have a patient in your office with a positive hepatitis C antibody and positive hepatitis C PCR viral load and the genotype, what's next? If you look at those guidelines, you scroll down, you'll see a big banner, simplified treatment for the treatment naive patient without cirrhosis. The first thing you see, who is not eligible for simplified treatment? And it's really important that for this purpose of this simplified guideline, we don't treat patients who have been previously treated for hepatitis C. So they've already had a treatment failure. They don't count. Patients with cirrhosis, patients with HIV, or patients who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive, that is, they have chronic active hepatitis B, patients who are pregnant, or those that maybe you suspect have hepatocellular carcinoma. And I think it goes without saying that most of us wouldn't try this on patients that uh, have had a liver transplant, for example. So who does that leave? Well, actually, that leaves most of your adult patients with chronic hepatitis C. The genotype doesn't matter. As long as they don't have cirrhosis and have been previously treated with hepatitis C and are not on that list of exclusions I just gave you. This is already starting to sound complicated. There must be a lot of evaluation that needs to be done before you embark on hepatitis C treatment. Well, actually not at all. Let's look at these guidelines. There are just a very few steps to pre-treatment evaluation. So I'll run through them briefly. I think you're going to be amazed at how few uh, evaluation you really need to do. First thing that's recommended in the pre-treatment evaluation is that you make some sort of assessment as to whether the patient has advanced fibrosis of the liver or not. You can do that really simply by calculating the FIB4 score, and that's easily done with lab values you already have on the patient. FIB4 score equals a patient age multiplied by AST, and all that's divided by the platelet count times the square root of the ALT. This is a uh, formulation that's been validated previously in order to estimate patient's fibrosis score. If the score is less than 1.45, you can be pretty sure the patient doesn't have severe fibrosis. A full explanation of the FIB4 can be found at the FIB4 calculator that's linked in the simplified guideline that I've been referring to, or you can just Google FIB4 calculator and it's all right there. Is that all? How about a liver biopsy or elastography? So those are all things that we used to do in order to try to try to figure out patients' fibrosis levels. And if they've already had those done, you do have to pay attention to them. You can't, the FIB4 doesn't override previous testing that's been done, but unless they've already had a liver biopsy that showed fibrosis, or they've already had elastography with a high level of liver stiffness, or you may have done some other non-invasive test in the past, some liver fibrosis tests like FibroSure. If none of those indicate a clinical fibrosis and you haven't seen cirrhosis on a CAT scan, then go right ahead. Just do the FIB4 score. If it shows a like, low likelihood of fibrosis, go right ahead and treat the patient. You don't even have to do any other evaluation. So what else do we have to do before we start treating? The rest, believe it or not, is actually pretty standard practice for clinicians. You're going to do a medical reconciliation to look for drug-drug interactions. I'll say more about drug-drug interactions with the hepatitis C drugs in a minute. We're going to educate the patient about the proper way to take the medicine, the importance of adherence, taking the medicine every day. Obviously, what steps they can take to prevent reinfection for hepatitis C once they're treated. But I think these are things that almost all clinicians would already do anyway. What about blood work? And there has to be blood work, I take it, right? Yeah, for of course, there's always something. But for the simplified hepatitis C treatment guidelines, you need a complete blood count or CBC, hepatic function panel, and an estimated glomerular filtration rate or GFR. These need to be done sometime within the six months before you initiate treatment. In reality, most patients have had those done anyway. You also need to get that hepatitis C viral load that I mentioned, HIV testing to make sure that you're not treating accidentally patient with HIV, hepatitis B surface antigen, make sure that patient is not co-infected with hepatitis B. And if there's any chance of pregnancy, it's advisable to do a pregnancy test. That's it. Wow. That's all. That is all. 
So then what? Then you prescribe the medication. You do everything in your power to make sure the patient takes the medication every day. And there you are. So there are a lot of hepatitis C medications out there. Which ones would you use? This is one thing I love about the simplified guidelines. The guidelines recommend choosing one of two regimens, and they don't have a preference. The two regimens are glucaprevir, probentosphere, with food for eight weeks, or cefospavir, velpatosphere, for 12 weeks. So don't those medicines have brand names that are a little bit easier to say? Yeah, they're a lot easier to say, actually. <laughs> glucaprevir, probentosphere, goes by the name of Maveret. And the um, Sofospivir Valpatosphere goes by the name of Epclusa. And that one even comes in a generic form as well. So you've narrowed it down to two choices. How do you choose between them? It really doesn't matter which one you choose. The Glucaprovir Probenosphere comes as a three-tablet, once-a-day regimen, which sounds kind of complicated, but it actually comes in a box that's really easy for the patient to take. Each day of the week, they pull out a separate little card. The three pills are on there. They can punch them out and take them all at once. That way they can keep track of each day they've done it. They can even bring the box back when you come back into the office so you can see how many they've actually taken. The Savasvir Valpatosphere comes as a single pill. So one part of the choosing is just comes down to patient choice. If the most important thing to the patient is the number of pills they're going to take each day, I'd go with the Savasvir Valpatosphere because it's only one pill a day. On the other hand, the other regimen, you don't want to make me say it again, right? <laughs> Glucaprovir pibrentosphere is only eight weeks, where savasavir valpatosphere is 12. So for patients who want to be treated in the shortest amount of time, I'd go for the first one. There's also a little bit about drug-drug interactions. These drugs, surprisingly, don't have a tremendous number of drug-drug interactions, but I'm sure there's going to be some pharmacists or pharmacy students in our audience And for glucaprovir provenosphere, those drugs inhibit PGP, BCRP, and the OAT-P1B3, which really doesn't come up very often in drug-drug interactions. They're weak inhibitors of cytochrome P450, CYP3A4 and 1A2, and UGT, and that'll make sense to some of our audience. Some of the common drugs that we usually look for are atorvastatin and Coumadin, or warfarin, Other than that, you know, there really aren't very many drug-drug interactions to worry about with that regimen, and I would just consult your drug interaction checker or a pharmacist. For Savasvir felpetosphere, otherwise known as Eclusa, that one's not recommended to be taken with a proton pump inhibitor. Those are real common antacids that a lot of people are on. For the pharmacists, again, it can inhibit PGP and BCRP and the OAT P1, B1, and B3. But again, there really aren't very many drugs that that affects, and it's probably worth running it through your standard drug-drug interaction checker, and that's about all. So I don't really use drug-drug interactions too often to choose between the regimens. The reality is that in many cases, the patient's insurance company may prefer one over the other, so you may not have as much of a choice. In that case, I simply prescribe the one that I prefer, and if it comes back that the insurance denies it, you can use the other one. I bet there's a lot of monitoring that you need to do while on treatment, right? So once you have treatment authorized and begun, not really a whole lot of monitoring. For example, of course, you're going to inform patients who are on medicines that might make them hypoglycemic, like some of the diabetes medicines, that they should watch for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. If the patient's on uh, Coumadin or another anticoagulant, they're going to monitor their pro-time and INR because it may change on treatment as you affect the liver. So you should monitor that. That seems pretty straightforward and obvious. But for all other patients, no other laboratory monitoring is required at all. Really? So what about patient support? Again, we're just leaving that up to the individual clinician. I like to have my patients come back for an in-person visit during treatment just so I can be sure they're taking their medication monitor their vital signs. But the reality is that can easily be taken care of during a telehealth or phone visit if it's more convenient for you or for the patient. The real reality of this medicine, which makes it all possible, is that these medicines have very few side effects. Most patients sail through treatment without any complaints whatsoever, 
In fact, when these first became available, one of the most common complaints that I would hear from patients were, this medicine must not be doing anything because I don't feel any different. (laughs) So once they finish the eight or 12 weeks of treatment, what do you have to do for follow-up? Follow-up is remarkably easy. Since we already know these patients didn't have cirrhosis going into treatment, the only thing you need to do is a post-treatment assessment of cure. That's what we've always called the uh, sustained virologic response or SVR. So you're saying that all you need to do is send one hepatitis C PCR RNA at least 12 weeks after treatment is completed and that's it? That's it. For patients who achieve the SVR, meaning that their hep C PCR DNA or RNA has gone to zero, there's no uh, further liver-related follow-up recommended because these patients didn't have cirrhosis going into treatment. I always counsel people who have ongoing risks, such as current IV drug use or MSM, who engage in unprotected sex, that again, they do risk contracting hepatitis C again. So I do like to discuss risk reduction and the need for future hepatitis C testing if they do have ongoing risk factors. So I'm sure you would always advise patients to avoid excess alcohol use. Of course, for all the good it does. Also, patients whose liver enzymes, the AST and ALT or bilirubin, uh, that don't return to normal at the end of treatment should probably be worked up for other causes of liver disease because we're used to seeing remarkable improvements in those liver enzymes after treatment. So how about patients who are not cured? After 12 weeks, their hepatitis C, RNA, PCR still shows positive. Those are really rare cases. However, in that case, I would probably refer to a hepatitis C treatment specialist. Well, that was really a lot easier than I was expecting. Really good news for hepatitis C patients who were diagnosed during the COVID pandemic and may not be able to access specialty care as easily as they were before or overcome the barriers accessing treatment that have always been there. How about a recap? Well, as long as we're here, I'm always up for a recap. So here it is. And I have tested this. Several of the residents who at the end say, yes, indeed, they would be able to treat patients in their own clinics for hepatitis C. Here's the recap. If you test for hepatitis C and you find a patient who's antibody positive, send a hepatitis C RNA quantitative PCR. This will most likely also get you the genotype, but if you don't get a genotype back, you can send one as well. The next step, satisfy yourself the patient likely doesn't have cirrhosis, either by calculating the FIB4 score or look at their previous liver testing. For blood work, make sure they've had an ALT, AST, bilirubin, CBC, and have been tested for HIV and hepatitis B within the last six months, and pregnancy testing whenever it's appropriate. Then. Pick between two recommended regimens based on the patient preference for pill count versus length of treatment, very rarely drug-drug interactions, and probably insurance coverage. Start the treatment, support the patient any way you see fit on treatment, either with in-person appointment, video or telephone follow-up, whatever you think is appropriate for that patient. Check for sustained virologic response or SVR at least 12 weeks after treatment is completed. And in that very rare instance where the patients still have a PCR positive, refer to a liver specialist. That sounds really good. Something nearly every clinician can put into practice immediately. Isn't there a simplified treatment guideline for patients with non-decompensated cirrhosis as well? Yes, there is, Jaron. And since we focused only on the patients without cirrhosis during this podcast, we've actually left ourselves open for maybe doing another one in the future. Well, thank you so much for your time, Steve. It it was wonderful talking to you as always. Thank you, Jaron. Hopefully people found this helpful. We're looking forward to listeners giving us some feedback and comments. Well, have a good day, Steve. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. And thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for a new episode of Conversations with CEI. Visit us at ceitraining.org and follow us on CEI social media platforms.